Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, for those who have just joined us, uh, I'm Natalie from Plarium, and I'm happy to see you here at Games Gathering 2023 online, but in Kiev as well. Uh, so we are ready to continue our uh, stream of lectures. And uh, our next speaker um, is Harry Nelson. He is the technical specialist at Special Effect. And uh, he will be talking about leveling the playing field, uh, a practical guide to accessibility in gaming. So uh, please welcome Harry. Uh, he's already with us. Hi, welcome. Hi, everyone. It's ple pleasure to meet you all. Um, yeah, so whenever you're ready, yeah, you can start the presentation. And uh, once uh, you want me to show the video, just let me know and I will uh, put it on the screen. Yeah, I, I will do. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, um, so, sorry, I'm going to see if I do it. Ooh, sorry, bear with me. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harry Nelson. I'm from the charity Special Effect. Uh, we're based in the UK and we've been going for, for 15 years. And for anyone who's not familiar with who we are and what we do, um, we essentially help people with physical challenges, physical disabilities, sort of spinal injuries, motor neuron disease, things of that nature, to access technology. Um, our, we're mostly known for our work in video games, um, but we also do a lot of work advising games companies on accessibility and how to make their games accessible uh, to, you know, all, all sorts of different audiences. Um, so like I said, we've been doing that for 15 years, day in, day out, with hands-on experience, working one-to-one -one in people's homes with them uh, to, to, get, to gain them access to, to the games that they, that they want to play. Um, so this talk is going to be all about sort of the, what we've learned from that and the sort of practicalities of it's one thing, accessibility kind of gets thrown around a lot. Um, it's one thing to, have a, to, to sort of have an idea of what to do, but this is just a, a talk from someone who does it, you know, as their bread and butter, this is what I do for a living uh, with some, some some of the large, you know, very large titles. So I worked on things like Sea of Thieves, Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, FIFA, the Forza series, um, all sorts of games. Um, they've sort of called us in to just help them with accessibility, uh, what settings to have, how to get their teams thinking about things, things of that nature. Um, so my particular role at Special Effect, I'm one of the technical specialists in research and development. So I have a hand in some of the controllers that we're going to be talking about, but also a big part of what I do is speaking with, with games companies, going to their offices, speaking with their teams and physically working on their games with them, you know, as the game progresses. So as mechanics are getting made, we're, we're thinking about the things we're going to be talking about um, just to make sure that we're not accidentally leaving anyone out and that the game can be as accessible and open to as many people as, as, as possible. So the first question I think, is is why it's always a good place to start. Um, you know why why do we why is accessibility important? And of course, there's a hundred different reasons why. Um, but the the main thing is, I think as as gamers, we we know that um, it's the, the video games can be an escape from the world. It can be a social interaction. It can be so many things. Um, but I can sit here and sort of try and tell you why in my own words. But honestly, I think it's probably better for you to see it yourselves. So I do have a video from one of our service users called Aaron, who plays in a very unconventional way. You've probably not seen it anything like it before. But he's fantastic the way he plays, and he competes online in Fortnite as well. So he's very, very good. Um, so if you could please play the play the video, if that's that's okay. Getting weaker, and I found it really hard to play games. And then the year progressed, and then I started getting a bit depressed because. I just couldn't play anymore. It would be too exhausting. So I'll be honest, I didn't think special effects would be able to help me, but they tried different angles, different positions, and they made this brilliant system that I use today. It's changed my life, honestly. With my adaptive system, with my feet, I use two controllers. I use the joysticks, the A, B, X and Y buttons, and then I use two ultralight switches on my right hand, which I use for the triggers, and then two ultralight switches on my left hand, which I use for the bumpers. So I had everything that I would normally use on a standard controller adapted to me, and I can use them again. With my disability, I'm limited to do things. I don't want to sound like a gameaholic, but it was one of the only things I could do for enjoyment. So gaming has really opened up that door for me and 
my life was restored back to the way it was. I was playing games, I had a social network like I did before, I had friends. It helps connect you to other people in this world. It's just fun and it's something for me to do, to unwind from GCSEs and pressure and, you know, just life. So games do me a lot to me. I don't know where I'd be without the effect. My hobby, gaming, it wouldn't be a thing anymore. So I'm really grateful for them for that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that is um, Aaron. And uh, as you can see, it's gaming to him is just as important as it is to, to any of us. Um, and again, we've all had those moments where uh, you know, being able to lose yourself in video games, the memories that you make, the friends that you make, uh, it becomes part of who you are. And especially if you're limited to do things, as he said, you can't necessarily join in with sports, or you can't do other things. So gaming becomes even more uh, important to, to people with physical challenges. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot more to it than, than that, but that, I think he sums it up quite nicely. Um, so moving on, I uh, just want to check, yep. So uh, what is accessibility? You know, well, what is it? It's a, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. Um, so again, this is my sort of definition as someone who, who does this sort of professionally. And it's, I fully admit that this makes no sense right now, but hopefully by the end of it, of uh, the end of the talk, it will make a bit more sense to you. Um, but I define accessibility as the art of identifying and remedying or fixing unintended moments of player disconnect, which I'm fully aware means absolutely nothing to anyone. Um, so to sort of spin it on its head a little bit, um, you could possibly think of it as accessib accessibility is the art of ensuring players are able to connect and interact with your game, um, which again, may not necessarily mean a whole lot to you, but by the end of the talk, hopefully that'll make a bit more sense. So to sort of flesh that out a bit further, really it's about making small, reasonable adjustments. I'm gonna say the word reasonable quite a lot. Um, it's about making reasonable adjustments. We're fully aware that there's, you know, you can't make a game accessible to everyone. There's time restraints, there's budget constraints. People are just too different to be able, you know, there's too many unique situations. Um, but it's about being what's reasonable to you, your team, your project. What can we reasonably do to make sure that not only players like Aaron with physical challenges, which is what I specialize in, but people with sort of sensory difficulties with, with uh, vision and audio or even just players in general, you know, just making sure that when people pick up your game, they don't unintentionally hit a wall where they suddenly get themselves so stuck or they fall between some sort of gap where they put the controller down and just say, this isn't for me, you know, this isn't the game for me. Um, and again, when you're designing games, there's obviously an element of friction, of difficulty, there's a challenge to overcome, that's what's fun about games. Uh, so that's why I've highlighted the word unintentionally, um, because there's there's one thing to design a game where you, you know the challenge and the friction that you've put in your game, but what accessibility really addresses is the little things that kind of get overlooked sometimes, or you might not necessarily think about the the effect that having that some of these small things can have, um, and really it's the art of player retention of making sure that at no point during your video game does the player ever want to put the controller down and say I don't want to play this game again. You know, they they just never hit that moment. They never get so stuck that they're not having fun. They never hit a mechanic that they don't understand. They never lose track of the story. It's all those things. It's making sure that from the moment they pick up the controller to the moment they put it down, they are fully immersed, they are fully connected to your game. Uh, and again, like I said, I, I focus on the physical side of that. So to break it down a little bit further, we've got motor access, which is all things to do with the physical human body, manipulated controllers, controlling the avatar in the game, which is what special effects uh, specialize in. There's sensory access, which is, again, that's things like your vision, any audio um, and spatial sort of conditions that, that might be effective. You think colorblind modes and things like that. And finally, there's cognitive access, which can be pretty much everyone, because everyone needs to be able to understand your game and, and connect with the story and the mechanics. Um, but it also includes things like brain injuries and learning difficulties and things of that nature. So you can sort of split it all down into these, these three main groups. 
Um, so in terms of motor, you've got things like control schemes. So that's everything from just physically, how do you control the characters and the elements in your game? What buttons are we using? How are we using them? Is there a way we could make better use of them? Uh, you know, things like remapping and things like that. Uh, interacting with game mechanics. So a good example of this is like the God of War series. Uh, famously, they've got their quick time events where you know you have to rapidly press circle, 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 and then triangle, and then spin the joystick, and you're doing all these things, right? And it's fantastic. It is quintessential God of War. And at no point, again, coming back to what is reasonable, it is, at no point would you want to lose that from God of War. It is quintessentially what God of War is about. Um, so it would be unreasonable to try and remove that. It's not about making games easier. It's not about removing fun mechanics. Uh, and to tie into that, you've got this awesome mechanic it's again, taking that extra moment to think and go, we've got this awesome mechanic. We know it requires spamming buttons. We want it to require spamming buttons. That's all intended. So let's think about some of these unintended things. Well, what if a player can't necessarily spam those buttons? What could we, what settings could we offer? What could we possibly do to make sure that a player who's having a really good time with our game, with God of War, doesn't suddenly hit one of these events and get so stuck that they can't play the game anymore and they never play another God of War because they know they can't play it. Um, so again, that's stuff we're going to look into. That's all things motor. Uh, sensory, again, this, you've probably come across this a bit more. Uh, colorblind options, subtitles, audio options. Uh, menu and screen narration is quite a big thing that we're seeing seeing coming through a lot more. But again, it's, 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 the, same, it's the same idea someone's happily playing the game and they suddenly hit an element where they, they just can't interact with the game anymore or they disconnect from the game, in this case, because of a sensory issue. And finally, cognitive issues, which really includes everyone. You don't have to have a disability. It's just every player really has to understand your game. So that's why tutorials are so important. Um, not only giving players the information they need to play the game, but we're starting to see now a lot of effort being put into making making tutorials fun. You know, they're no longer just text boxes. So a really good example of this is from Street Fighter VI, um, especially the, the new world tour mode where you're kind of just playing the story and you're having a good time. And at some point you accidentally learn how to play Street Fighter. Um, and it's because the entire mode is basically a, a glorified tutorial, um, but it's fantastically well done. At no point does it feel like a tutorial yet a player is completely able to connect with a game, with a, with a genre that is famously quite quite tricky to, to integrate new players into because they are, fighting games are, are difficult. Um, again, things like UI and menu design, just making sure that people understand how to navigate the game. We've always come into games where there's so many menus on the screen, they're all titled weird things that you can't really connect to and you just disconnect because you, you just physically can't really pass what you're seeing. You can't really understand what it is that you're seeing. And again, that could be a moment where someone just goes, I can't be bothered learning this. This is just too much. Um, understandable game mechanics. So a good example of this is Path of Exile. Um, anyone who's played that game, it's a fantastic game. They've got a fantastic system of talents and like sort of skill points you could spend. And at no, again, similar to God of War, you don't need to take it out. It's, it's quintessential Path of Exile. It's what makes the game. Um, however, it is a point where you hit level two, you're excited, you open up the skill tree and you get 1300 different options all at once. And for some players, that's fantastic. They love that. But for quite a few players, especially if they're new to video games or they're new to the genre, it can be too much. It can be a moment where they just go, I don't even know where to begin with this. Um, so again, you can keep the mechanic. We want you to keep the mechanic. It's totally fine. You can make difficult games. You can have tricky and complex mechanics with just taking that moment to think about the unintended consequences of that. Um, just making sure how do we present this complex mechanic in a way that isn't going to cause people to just be completely overwhelmed. And finally, uh, connecting with the minimum of your game. This is kind of a weird one, but essentially what I boil this down to is at some point, you know, during a game is there's, again, there's, there's a basic thing in your game that you sort of promised. So some games are story games. Some games, the fun is about playing online with your friends. Some games, it's about having an RPG adventure or being chilled out. And even if a player can't compete at an esports level or they're not playing on the hardest difficulty, a good sort of baseline to aim for with accessibility is 
you know, if you've got a game where it's a story driven game, let's make sure that as many people as is reasonably possible for us to do can experience that story. Maybe they have to do it with some settings. Maybe they have to, maybe they do have to play it on an easier version. Um, maybe they'll never compete at the highest level or they won't set a speed run record. That's fine. But at least they've bought the game, they've spent their money and they've connected with it. They were able to experience the minimum sort of promise of what you said they could do. Um, be that a story or playing with their friends or, you know, fighting with their friends, whatever it might be. Um, there is a sort of minimum uh, expectancy when someone buys a game that they've, they've paid money, they expect to be able to do at least this. Um, so that's usually a good bar to set. Is can, can the player at least do the minimum of, of our game? But for the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on motor access because that's really what, what I do. Uh, but again, all of that is generally about player retention. It's making sure that players never hit a wall where they suddenly never want to play the game again. Um, so how does this all function in practice? What's the practical side of this? How do we implement this? Well, it's all about giving players the tools they need to level their own playing fields. Um, again, according to their individual requirements. So you've so tools can be anything, it's usually settings, um, but it can be things from level design to menu design to all sorts of things, general customizability, um, but you're giving them some control over the game. And again, you're not, it, just from experience, it's not worth trying to think of every individual disability and every possible thing, because you're never gonna do it. There's, I've seen 300 people with cerebral palsy, I've never seen the same set up twice it's never happened it's never going to happen but people are they are experts on their own body they know what they're struggling with they know what they find hard they know how they want to play the game more importantly um, so rather than trying to solve it for them it's not your job to solve it for them just give them the tools give them the tools so that they can decide how they want to play the game they've bought the game, they've paid the money, they're entitled to play it however they want uh, within, you know, terms and service and all the rest of it. But um, again, it's it's about not, not assuming that you know what's best for them. They know what's best for them. Just give them the tools, give them the hammer and let them decide how they want to use the hammer if and when they want to use it. So what does that sort of look like in practice? So from a physical standpoint, there are specialized controllers. This is the Xbox adaptive controller that we helped to develop. Um, so this is just a standard Xbox One controller, but you can see on the back there, you've got various switch ports so that you can plug in different buttons and joysticks. And this is how Aaron and other people with physical disabilities are able to uh, sort of interact with, with video games. So this is what's referred to as a switch interface um, because as you, as you saw, people with sort of, such as Aaron, um, or if you've got amputations, you know, war veterans, um, all sorts of people, even just have repetitive strain injury, there's all sorts of reasons why someone might find a regular controller difficult. Um, but they may find, you know, using their whole hand a bit more comfortable. In Aaron's case, it was his feet. Uh, but, you know, some people use their head, their elbow, their shoulders. And rather than trying to conform or contort someone to fit a controller, uh, the thinking behind this is that you can bring the controller to them. So if they're in a wheelchair or they need to be in a specific position because that's what's comfortable for them, you can bring the buttons to them rather than trying to make them hold a, a tiny controller that might be uncomfortable for them. So that's that's the Xbox sort of switch interface. There is a Nintendo version, which is the Hori Flex. And again, you can see a sort of very basic uh, example setup on, on the right there with you know joystick plugged in, a couple buttons to give you, give you an idea of, of how it all works. And again, um, they do have some special settings in it, so I do, I highly recommend getting at least one of each uh, into your studio so that you can actually plug them in, play with it yourself, give your teams a challenge of like, okay, we've got this cool game. You know, what if someone can only access one joystick? Let's let's set that up and see how far can you get in the game with one joystick. And it's eye-opening to see, actually, whoa, 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 we get stuck at this point, we get stuck at this point, and maybe we could do this and this and this. Um but uh, they've got various different settings that like, have different profiles and various clever things. So it's definitely worth getting your hands on one just to be, at least become familiar with it um, so that you know what, what is physically out there for players um, because that will then determine how much you need to do in, in your games design to sort of alleviate that. And of course, again, we, we worked with Sony on on um, the, new, the new PlayStation as well. Uh, version, which again, is, is a slightly different shape, but it's, it's the same idea. You plug switches in and... Um, you can, you know, have access. You can bring that controller to to fit someone more more comfortably 
according to their needs rather than forcing them to necessarily contort to the standard version. But the part that's more important to sort of game, de game designers, game developers, publishers is the game side tools. These are the settings, the assists uh, and all that stuff. This is where you get to be really creative and make the headlines as the new accessible game and you get all that good PR and everyone, everyone loves you. Um, and we can split that down into two elements. So there's inputs and there's gameplay. So inputs is everything to do, again, similarly with, with physically controlling the elements of your game. So that can be things from, from remapping, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, making sure your game recognizes different controllers because you know um, not everyone wants to play or necessarily finds, some people wanna play mouse and keyboard, some people wanna play controller. And it's very common that you find that if you plug a controller in and you plug a keyboard in, if you press a keyboard, the game recognizes that keyboard's in, it can swap back and forth uh, in real time. Some games can't do that. Um, or if you happen to control, so there's a co-pilot as well, which is what Aaron was doing, where you can use two controllers separately to act as a single controller. So he had one under each, each foot. Um, Sony currently have this in, in the beta testing for PS5. Um, and the reason someone might do that again is, is if someone can only access a few buttons, it's often they'll have a friend or a family member, you know, their dad, their brother, their sister, their mum. Uh, maybe doing the joysticks and some of the buttons, some of the more harder stuff, and they're just doing the, the button. That's a nice way to share. Or for some reason, they just need their controller broken apart in that way. But again, some games, when you plug two controllers in, even if you've got Copilot, it will pick up that there's two controllers and put them as player one, player two. Um, so you, you can't access that. Um, certain holds and toggles with buttons when it comes to that. Again, back to that God of War element, are there ways that, you know, possibly getting round spamming buttons, does this button necessarily need to be a hold? So my example for that was when we were working on Sea of Thieves, the original animation to load cannonballs, you had to hold X because that's how long the animation lasted. Um, but we were getting feedback from players that they can't, for them, that it was, it was physically difficult to hold that button down for that long. And when we spoke to them, they go, yeah, we, we don't actually know why we did that. It was just, that's how long the animation was. So it just felt right. Um, so again, they kept that as default, but there is now a setting in Sea of Thieves to, to just make that a, a single press and it will just do the action for you. Um, again, it doesn't affect anyone other than the people who, who need it. And then things like sensitivity, reducing the amount of buttons to, to again, the, the minimum that you really need. We're not just randomly putting extra buttons in there for no real reason. Um, uh, and then gameplay wise, again, really want to stress, it's not about making your game easier, making so you can see that adjustable difficulty. Making a game easier is one tool that you could offer if it is reasonable and if it is appropriate. But I put adjustable difficulty because rather than thinking of oh, the game is either this or it's super easy, it, it's good to get in the habit of just thinking of it as a slider. Um, and we'll have default somewhere in the middle. And then you can have you can have an easier mode and but also offer a super hard, you know, you die in one death mode for the people that want that. Because again, that might be how they want to access the game. That That is still accessibility. It's still including those players. It's still keeping those players and retaining the, those players who do want that extra challenge, you know. So when it comes to things like your, your Dark Souls games, you know, your famously difficult games. Again, if you force the game to be easier on people, then they're going to kick up a fuss about that. But if you give everyone the option to go, look, Go nuts, make the game as hard or as easy as you want. You're playing it at home in the comfort of your own house, go wild. Um, again, it's one tool and it's just how you think about how do we implement this. Um, it's a similar thing for adjusting the player's the player strength. So rather than making the game, the elements of the game easier, you for some reason make the player more powerful, they can make them invincible, you can give them more strength, you could have more drops of health and items in the world, all sorts of clever ways to do that. And this is where you really get to be creative. And like I said, make those headlines as the big new accessible game. And module six is your friends. This refers to the dev kit, which is something I'll talk about in a minute. But there's an entire module that will, you know, give you examples and, and uh, feedback and, and information on, on how other people are tackling some of the problems that, that you might be uh, experiencing. How have other people implemented difficulty and player strength? and how have they fiddled with those settings in creative ways to get those sort of juices flowing. But again, I'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm not gonna go into all of it, don't worry. Uh, but just to start with, just to give you an example of, of something like inputs. So this is a, a short clip from um, our, our dev kit, but this is from The Last of Us Part Two. So this is an example of, of remapping, but what's known as contextual remapping, where 
rather than have, uh, say, accelerate and ascend and descend in swimming be different buttons, we can think, how could we minimize this down to the fewest possible buttons? And again, by default, that might not be appropriate, but they offer the option to remap, what again, what's called contextual remapping. So if you're driving a, a vehicle, in this case, a boat, and you want to accelerate, you can press R1. But you'll never drive a boat and be swimming in the water at the same time. You're either in the boat or you're, or you're swimming. Um, so we can reuse that button. We can reuse that R1 rather than giving it a, a random other button. Um, and again, by default, it can be a random other button, but it's about giving players tools. So in, in the case of The Last of Us Part Two, they allow you to remap that because the context, uh, you, you at no point will you need to be doing those two actions at the same time. So that's, a, that's a, an example, uh, sort of contextual remapping as, as an advancement of standard remapping, again, of, of, of giving players that tool, that customizability to make sure that they're able to minimize the buttons down to what they personally need. But again, it's 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 away in the settings. The default game is exactly as you designed it. It's just a setting that's in the game for, for people who need it. So again, coming back to, to God of War, uh, classic quick time, quick time event, you're spamming circle. Again, people with repetitive strain injury, this might be very painful for them to do. Uh, people like Aaron, it's just physically difficult for them to do. People with cognitive issues might not necessarily understand what to do. So again, by default, it's the classic quick time event. You're not changing anything. However, the accessible side of that is again, we've, we've taken a minute to think, hang on, this could be a moment where someone puts the game down. So we've offered them the tool, which in this case is the ability to either have it, have the event be done with a single button press, or you can just hold a button down, or they've offered that you can just have it play as like a normal cutscene. And again, for, for some players, that for, it's there for the players that want it. The default is the usual game that everyone knows and expects. However, what you're doing is you're giving a player a tool that if they do hit this, this wall where they, they just physically can't do this thing, um, there's a tool in the game that they can choose whether or not they want to do that. Some players might want to push through and learn how to do the quick time events, but for other players who just physically can't or cognitively can't, this shouldn't be a reason why they're not allowed to continue this awesome story they've been enjoying. And they, again, you've given them the tool so that they can choose to, to progress the story however they want to. Uh, gameplay, so again, there's modifying player strength. So a famous example of this is from a few years back is Celeste. So again, a default game is nice and difficult, a great challenge, speedrunners love it, very well, uh, you know, award-winning game. But within their settings, you can give yourself, you can just make yourself full on invulnerable so that you can't die. You can give yourself infinite dashes, um, infinite stamina, so you can cling onto the walls for as long as you want. You can modify how quickly the game moves, which is a fantastic setting. Again, all of this, it's you're giving players tools so that they can decide how they want to play the game. A similar implementation of this is something in Smash Brothers where you can give certain players handicaps. If you're playing with a friend who's significantly better than everyone else, or if you, for some reason, are at a, dif uh, at a disadvantage to other people, um, you can adjust players' power uh, relative to that. And again, that's a player choice that they can choose to do that. You're not forcing it on them. You're not trying to decide it for them. The default game is just the default game as per usual. And again, it's when you do it right, no one, no one really notices that it's in there other than the people who need it. Uh, FIFA, again, it's in there. You can, as you can see, there are all these different elements of how to control your player, how fast does he run, how fast does he accelerate, how fast does he shoot the ball, all these different elements. Um, we're controlling, you've offered them sliders. Sliders are fantastic. Love a slider. Or if it's not a slider, but gradations of things, be that difficulty, um, is, is fantastic. So if someone's struggling with a particular element of the game, they might want the game to be completely default, but for some reason, you know, shooting... Just the, just the speed of the shot, they can't hold the button down long enough to get a good, powerful shot. Uh, FIFA offer the opportunity, they offer the tool that if that's the one element of the game you're struggling with, you can power that that up for you. Um, it does vary when you come to online play, but again, that's that's, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Um, sort of game difficulty, again, from, from Tomb Raider, uh, there's the overall difficulty, which we're used to seeing this sort of like 
again, they've, they've labeled it in a different way, which is quite nice. We're seeing a lot of that now where there's like a story mode version of the game and, you know, it's no longer being called like easy, medium, hard, just so people don't really feel bad about playing on, e on easy mode. I mean, I play on easy mode, I don't really mind. I just chill, but it depends on the game. But, um, you know, it, it's again, it's offering that gradation. It's offering tools. It's it's not trying to enforce a certain thing, a certain way of playing on, onto, play, onto players. It's There's the default one that you designed as the experience as you intended. Um, but you've also given them the tool so they can customize it as and where is reasonable, as and where is appropriate to what they want. So in the case of Tomb Raider, you've got the combat difficulty, exploration puzzles. So someone like, I don't know, Aaron may really struggle with combat just because of the speed of it. So they might have that on easy, but there's nothing wrong with his mind. He's, he's just as sharp as anyone else. So he might put the puzzles up really high and gain challenge from the game in, in that way. And that might be how he chooses to play. Whereas other people with a cognitive issue might find the puzzles very difficult. So they put those on, on easy, but they might really love the combat and they put that on hard to get, and that's how they get the challenge. So again, it's just breaking down the game uh, into those gradations, into, into those tools, letting players customize so that they can play it how they want to. Again, uh, another example here where you can see, you know, there's the players. And again, you can see that, in terms of UI and that cogni cognitive accessibility, what do these settings do? What, what's the difference between moderate and uh, you know more difficult? And it can tell you exactly what happens. The amount of damage the player takes from enemies is adjusted, and the frequency of encounters is adjusted. You know when it's enemies health, stealth, it actually tells you what it is, what it is that that it is you're adjusting. But again, it's breaking down that game so that if someone's having a fantastic time playing with their game and they hit a specific point that they can't connect with, there's a moment of disconnect, they're going to put the game down. They're not going to put the game down because you've put the tool in there that says, hey, you know what, you're struggling with that. We've got a setting in here. You you can change it. You, this doesn't have to be a reason why why you no longer engage with our with our franchise. Um, and it's it's usually very, it's usually quite simple to do. Again, it depends on what's reasonable, where you are in development, all the rest of it. Um, but it's why it can be important to make accessibility part of the entire development cycle so that these things can be thought about and built into the game from scratch rather than trying to just slap them on after as an afterthought. Um, it just gives your teams, uh, one, you can do a better job of it, but two, it gives your teams more time to, to think and really flesh out exactly how they want these things to, to occur. And it stops you getting in trouble with being called easy mode and all the rest of it. Um, so this is from the new Star Wars uh, Jedi Survivor. They've introduced, again, a slow mode, similar to Celeste, where you can just slow down the entire game speed. Again, people who might physically struggle with how quickly they can react to things or cognitively struggle to how quickly they can react to things. New gamers might find this helpful. Uh, perhaps older gamers who, who might not be so used to modern games. All sorts of reasons why someone might want the setting. And again, they've allowed it so that it only applies in combat and it automatically implies in combat because with the normal slow mode, you have to press triangle uh, to, to, to trigger it. And again, that's an additional button. So you can see up in the top right, there's triangle for slow mode. Um, that's another button. So again, they've got that the setting in there for automatically activate it. So you can remove that button. Um, it's just little things like this. And I know it seems very small, but it does make an enormous difference because there are millions of players out there who who do have some sort of physical challenge or sensory challenge or cognitive challenge who do want to play video games. Like I said, even more so than normal um, able-bodied people because they can't access sports. They can't access usual things. So they, they love getting lost in these worlds that, that you create. Um, and so, you know, that's not only a lot more players, it's a good increase in money. It's a pretty much free PR win that you get to be known as the guys who include people. Um, there's not a whole lot of downside. Again, it's it's about being reasonable. Sometimes people, you know, are asked to do something that's completely unreasonable, like make a Dark Souls game super easy. No, that's not what it's about. Um, if you're making a hard game, it should be hard. It's just within the element of that, are there things, are there settings, are there tools we can do so that everyone has a reasonable chance of experiencing that that bare minimum of, of what it is that they want. So I've mentioned a couple of times something called the dev kit. So this is sort of it broken down. So what the dev kit is, is it's a free online resource that we've made where we've basically consolidated 
our 15 years specific game design knowledge um, into seven modules. And they're just videos that you could play really quick on a lunchtime or something like that. And you can see, I said, module six is your friend. Module six is assistance. So that's all things to do with player power, adjusting difficulties, um, things like slow modes and health and all those sorts of things. Um, it's generally, it's good to wrap your head around that because I think that's often where people get themselves in trouble sometimes with accessibility is they, they don't necessarily understand it and think it through as, as well as they maybe could have. Um, and they get themselves in trouble by making it, you know, they, they alienate some of their players and they get accused of making a game too hard or too easy or too simple or too complex. And, and, and in reality, that's not what it's about. You can make the game exactly as it is. It's just about having reasonable settings again. And what is reasonable, it depends on budget, time restraints, the genre of your game, what your vision for the game is, all those sorts of things. Um, but that's all in all in module six for you. So here's a breakdown of that a bit more because they are broken down into subsections. So you see again, module six, there's player strength, game difficulty, timing elements, analog elements. Um, but say if you're, you're working on a new mechanic, you're thinking you've just introduced a new button into the game, um, you can look into the input sections, you know, action mapping, input interaction, input interactions are things like the God of War, you know, quick time events. You've got a cool mechanic like that. You want people to spam buttons but you, you want to be accessible as well. You want to think, okay, what settings could we have? Uh, you can go to the dev kit. You can you know, quickly navigate to, to module three. You can find the exact you know, module 3.2, 3.4, whatever it is that is appropriate to the problem that you're having. Watch a short five minute video of us. Again, like we said, this is what we do day in, day out um, on, on some of the, you know, anything from very large titles to just indie titles. Um, but you can go there, see what other studios are doing here are thoughts on why this is good, when it might be appropriate to do this, why a player might struggle with these actions so to get your sort of brain thinking, you know, oh, okay, so I've got this new mechanic, I've got these buttons, it's similar to this, so maybe this setting might also apply to, to me. Um, so there's things like continuous holds, there's things like, again, so 3.7 there, there's contextual interactions, and next to it, 2.7, contextual mapping. Um, so if you ever want just uh, a bit of a breakdown of accessibility, this is a really good resource. Again, it's completely free um, for your teams to sort of have. I just highly recommend sort of bookmarking it or something so that as they're just developing, as you're having those meetings and those conversations, you know, you can just go, go okay, accessibility, let's just, we've got this new mechanic, we've got this new world, we've got this new level, we've got this new game. Let's just quickly run it through the dev kit. Just make sure that we're we're not unintentionally losing a significant portion of our player base um, or potential player base because of because of like I said these these small unintended moments in the game where they put the game down and say it's not for me. So this is a bit what it looks like. So you can see here's number seven, get a breakdown. Um, there's the full you know full 15 minutes. You can watch it if you want to, or you can just watch the individual mod modules. Again, so it's really easy just having a have it as a bookmark or save it on your web page or something. Just make it a habit. If you make a mechanic, if you add something new find its relevant module in the dev kit and just double check have we accidentally overlooked something here that might be a potential issue um so just a sort of element of, of what the video sort of look like they just break down how the settings are, are implied how they've been implemented why they've been implemented all those sorts of things and again, just a bit of how, how to navigate it. So that's one resource that's available to you. And one thing I think that um, studios find very helpful is at the very bottom of the pages, it's sort of tucked away, but you've got a checklist. And if you click on that, it actually takes you to a, a, an actual checklist. That, again, we've written ourselves in conjunction with people like Microsoft and, and various studios um, so that you can actually go through the various elements of your game module by module and again, it's by no means complete. It's just something that you and your teams, again, to get to get your teams thinking um, and yourselves thinking, just tick off like, hey, have we thought about this? Have we thought about this? And again, it's okay to say, you know what, for our game, this isn't reasonable, this isn't appropriate. But that's that's gone from being an unintended oversight to being an intentional decision that you've thought about, you, you understand why for your game that's not necessarily uh, an appropriate thing to do and you can do that for for going work your way through the entire modules again and just 
give yourself a sense that actually yes we we we've ticked the various boxes and we, we know why we've done certain things why we've got certain settings and why we don't have other settings um so that at least the game that you've made it's not unintentionally inaccessible if there's you know you, you everything about the design has become intentional um so i think it's a very good it's, we've had a lot of feedback that it's, it's a very helpful resource for, for developers and then the final resource that I can really offer you is, is a site called Game Access Info. Again, it's something that, that we maintain completely free. Um, none of this has, there's no ads or anything like that. It's just purely information to, to help developers and players. So this is a really good, we basically do blogs on the latest and greatest in all things accessibility. Um, so you can see there's The Last of Us Part One, there's God of War. So if a new game comes out, we'll probably have a blog post written by one of our professional uh, sort of occupational therapists. Um, again, with that real world experience of working with people, you get a full breakdown of the game, of, of the accessibility features, what they will do, why they're implemented, why they might be useful to players. Um, so if you just want to keep up to date with what's going on, or if there's a game that's come out that's similar to what you're working on and you want to just double check, you know, what, what did they do? Um, you can probably find a blog on a, a post on it. Uh, that can just give you the full professional, very easy to understand breakdown. This is what they did. This is what why they did it. You know, uh, keep yourself up to date. And again, you can see how to program a hitch, which is another switch interface. Um, it can also help you stay up to date with the hardware. You know, in terms of what's the latest in controllers, uh, such as the new the, the new PS5 one coming out. What's the latest in buttons and joysticks? How are people uh, with these challenges accessing games? You can just stay up. It's a good way to stay up to date with what's going on. So here's, I think the most recent one is, is Star Wars Jedi Survivor, complete full breakdown of the game, all the different settings, why you might use it. Um, and again, you can see on the right-hand side, you can sort of search by uh, the genre of game. You can search by how many buttons is required, all these sorts of different things um, so that you can just find information that is relevant to, to, to the project that you're working on uh, at the moment. Um, there are plenty of other online resources, but these are ones that are maintained again by us um, for, for what we're worth. You know, we've got, like I said, there's 15 years of, you know, we've, we've seen thousands and thousands of, of players. This is this is what we do. This is solely what we do, um, working with with everyone. You know, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, all all the all, and various publishers. Um, and, and designers and developers. So if, you, if you're ever just a bit confused and not quite sure where to go, or you just want to double check something, uh, either the dev kit or game access info is probably a good place to start. Um, and again, and you can always uh, be, get in touch with us, but that's that's sort of the end of, of my talk. And hopefully that's been a little uh, introduction to how you can start to practically you know, implement some of these things, how you can get thinking about accessibility while still keeping your game exactly as you designed it. You know, you don't need to make it easier. You don't need to lose mechanics. It, it can be as complicated as you want. It can have as many buttons as you want. Um, you know, you can have crazy die in a single death modes. That's absolutely fine. Um, it's just about how can we do that and keep the game accessible for everyone, um, or at least as many people as is reasonable. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen to me. Um, here on screen is just the website for the dev kit, for Game Access Info. And we do offer a service that if you are, are a developer or a publisher and you've, you've got a project that you would like us to sort of just at least throw some ideas around, you know, we've got this core mechanic. Uh, we're not quite sure how to make it accessible. Would you mind taking a look at it? Again, just send us an email, uh, info a special effect, and you'll be put forward, put through to you know the appropriate person. And we're more than happy to, to look at your games or have a call with you or talk to your teams or however it is that, that whatever you feel would help you. And again, it's everything we do is 100% free. Um, so at no point is there any, you won't get charged for anything. It's literally just free advice um, based on our 15 years of experience. Um, but yeah, that is that is me. And um, that's, that's my talk. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, this is really great what you're doing. So thank you for that. This is really uh, this is really socially responsible. So great job out there. And uh, yeah, we we have some questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how long does it take to develop such an equipment that helps um, people with some disabilities uh, access uh, games better? 
so in terms of the the hardware, like the controllers, mm -hmm. um, so yep. something like the Xbox Adaptive Controller, the XAC for short, uh, it took about three years total, but one of that was sort of thinking the idea mm -hmm. through. So, so three years total, but about two years of practically, you know, making prototypes and testing things and a similar sort of time span for for the uh ps5 controller as well we got we had the original prototype back in sort of i want to say early 2020 um and it's it's just been sort of announced and it's going to be coming out uh, at some point in the in, in the near okay. future so um yeah two, two three years to make a, a controller from scratch like that and in terms of production uh, capacities, how, uh, how many uh, prototypes, for example, for uh, hand controllers, um, is it possible to produce yearly or monthly? Like if, if you have any um, I, I, I wouldn't know. Again, it probably depends on, on your resources, what, what, what you can do. People like Microsoft and Sony can pump out a lot. Um, but we also do work with basically people who are just engineers in their sheds who just very much make them all by hand. Uh, there's a company called Evil Controllers. Uh, they're, they're not in their sheds, but they, they sort of started out like that. Um, and they now fulfill a significant mm -hmm. number of, of, of orders. Um, but yeah, it depends on your, it depends on your resources and, and what you're making. And um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's not the best answer. Okay. But... And, uh, yeah, got it. Thanks. Uh, another question is, uh, how do you uh, track uh, which disabilities you should adapt uh, the equipment for? And do you uh, target any specific countries or, I don't know, groups of people uh, or whatever? Uh, yeah, so in terms of how we sort of operate, um, basically players will get in contact with us and they'll, they'll send us an email saying, I've got cerebral palsy and I want to play FIFA, or whatever it is. Um, and we've got a team of occupational therapists and, and sort of technical people like me. Um, and depending on who's appropriate, we will work with them throughout their entire life to make sure that they can play any and all games that they want to. Um, in terms of from a designer and a developer point of view, um, sort of targeting people again, it's it's not necessarily worth doing. It's that's why I recommend getting a hand on 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 the equipment yourselves, um, so that you can basically just have little jam sessions and say like, okay, if I've only got one joystick, how far in the game can I get? If I've only got three buttons, how far can I get? Um, if I can, if I don't allow myself to hold a button down, I have to. I can only tap them. How far can I get? How many issues do I run into? Uh, that could be a good way to to test that because. If you just think of it like oh cerebral palsy or something, um, a lot of those someone who struggles with cerebral palsy will have the same struggles as someone with motor neuron. It, there's a lot of like crossover. Um, so from a designer point of view, it's probably just easier to think of things as how many buttons do I need, you know, how many joysticks do I need to to get through the game? Um, because if you give people the tools, they know themselves and they'll be able to figure it out out themselves you don't you don't need to figure it out for them you don't need to target specific people really <laughs> okay got it and um do you um uh, well i understand that it's uh, well close to impossible to adapt uh, to uh, to adapt such equipment to people with all kinds of disabilities uh, but are you planning to um I don't know how to say it properly, like extend the range of uh, equipment for, for example, for people who have like hearing problems, because some some games are like very audio and they require like good um, uh, good headphones or stuff like that, that like you need hearing for for, for, yeah. for some games to play them. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just on a previous one. Um, I forgot to say, uh, we, we oh, operate yeah. in, inside the UK, um, physically inside the UK. But if it can be online, we will global is is fine. We're happy to talk to any studios, anyone, anywhere. Um, it's just in terms of physically visiting people's houses, mainly for Brexit reasons. Uh, it's <laughs> it's easier. Um, but in terms of the more sensory uh, things and adaptive uh, adapting equipment to that, we are starting to see a lot of improvements in that in that field in general. Especially, like I said, in terms of game design and things, um, we are seeing a lot of very clever 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 things coming in like like menu narration like people having the screen narrated to them um the use of 3d sound 3d headsets so that you can get actually like hear where enemies are um fortnite has a really cool uh setting in it which is kind of like an audio radar where you, you know 
it's been in shoot games for a while, but when you get hit, you get like a little red marker over here to select the, the enemy somewhere vaguely over here that you've been shot from. Uh, they've got one of those, but for sounds in general. So like if you can't hear the sound, it will display on this little circular radar that a sound has occurred over this over this way. So you kind of know to to turn around, which I think is a really clever, I, I love it, I've made that setting, I think that's genius. Um, but we're starting to see things like that uh, crop in a bit more. But in terms of, again, hardware, I think for audio things, there's the uh, things like, you know, 3D, 3D audio is, is a huge factor in being able to give players um, almost echo location so, so they know where to place themselves, where sounds are coming from. Um, clear sound design can help a lot so that you don't just have muffled sounds where everything sounds the same. Um, in terms of settings, being able to break sounds down where you can turn the music down, but the effects up so that you can, if you, you're, again, if you're someone who really needs to hear when gunshots and things are being fired, you might not necessarily, as beautiful as the music is, it might just be a distraction for you. So again, having that ability to adjust that. Um, and for things like sight, we're seeing a lot of things uh, such as being able to remove backgrounds from video games. So I think Street Fighter, again, Street Fighter does this, um, where you can just turn off backgrounds so that if you do have sort of uh, problems with vision, obviously seeing two characters that are just on a blank screen, even if you can't really make out the characters, you can see shape A is over here and shape B is over here. But if you've got a complicated background, it all just blurs together. Um, so being able to remove that uh, can be very helpful. Again, level design, just making sure things are signposted clearly offering settings that maybe increase certain elements that tell you where to go and what to do, uh, things like that can be very helpful. Okay, cool, thanks. And I guess uh, the last question is, um, maybe I have misunderstood you, but you said that you would do uh, these things for free. Uh, did you mean uh, like consultations or uh, like the, 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 the development of this equipment? Because um, if, if it's the second, uh, uh, option then uh where do you get the funding from maybe you have like some investors who regularly donate money or how do you get the funding for your project um so yeah so we, we are we are a charity and we are supported entirely through just generous donations from mm -hmm. supporters um we don't take any money from microsoft or sony or nintendo or anyone like that uh the reason for that is it's very important to us to remain neutral uh we don't Obviously, we, we we don't want people to feel that you know we're we're pushing a certain controller or a certain game because they've given us money. Um, so all of our money is is by just individual people. You know, you, you and I going out doing fun runs and selling cakes and weird and wonderful things like that. Um, and there, there are some companies that you know with bigger budgets who very generously donate to us. But again, it's it's not in a they don't pay us for our services. So in terms of the consultation for things like working with game developers, it's it's a, just an entirely free process. It's just we we know we've got this experience and this expertise and that there is a growing interest in, in this. So we're very happy to see. Um, and a lot of new designers or just people just just want to make sure that they're, they're understanding, they've got a good understanding of this because uh, it can be a bit tricky and you know every now and then people get themselves in a bit of hot water through no fault of their own it's just it's it's a new field um but yeah it's it's entirely free the equipment that we learn is is free in terms of um the xbox data controller the sony controllers again all of that we, we were effectively consultants on on those projects but again it was it was entirely free we don't get any money from them at all we're just happy that it exists because it means people with disabilities can can play video games so that's that's what we get out of it Be, people can play games that's what that's what we're here for <laughs> oh yeah yeah that, well that's that's the awesome job that you're doing and yeah oh uh, well i wish you best of luck with that this is really great um yeah i think we are out of questions for now but uh please feel free to reach out to harry if you have any others left so yeah, thanks again for uh, for an inspiring talk and a great presentation of your projects. This is really cool and uh, keep up with the good job. And by the way, nice Overwatch poster. I love Overwatch, so hey. <laughs> I just know. There we go, there we go. Yeah. thank you. <laughs> okay, then I uh, hope you will have a nice rest of the conference and we hope to hear from you soon. Yeah, thank you for having me, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, have a ni nice rest of the day. Bye. Bye-bye.